Welcome to the video key for quiz two. So in this uh, question, this first question, we've got some molecules here. And to figure out the IMS, we probably should draw the molecules. So and we, we, we can just put lone pairs on the oxygen and the oxygen. And that will be enough that we can get this done. So clearly, we can see dipoles. Uh, but we have to worry about, um, so if dipoles, we have dipole, dipole. Let's just circle line and dispersion because we always know we have that. And if we have at least one of them have a dipole, we have dipole induced dipole. What about H bonding? Well, if we have uh, this molecule here, this 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 uh, aldehyde, it can't H bond be with other aldehyde molecules because it doesn't have uh, a hydrogen directly bonded to an oxygen fluorine or nitrogen. Uh, but it does have an H bond acceptor right here, this, this portion of the molecule. And this mo portion of the molecule over here has an H bond donor in the form of this hydrogen, which is directly bonded to this oxygen. So we could have a hydrogen bond between that hydrogen and that oxygen. So we do have hydrogen bonding interaction between unlike molecules. Number two. Okay, so we're mixing acid and base. So we imagine equal amounts of acid and base. We've got acid, we've got base. And notice that it's not just equal volumes, it's equal concentrations. So that means that the um, moles are the same. And so if we read out the reaction here, we've got a monoprotic acid reacting with a monobasic base, right? We've got one hydrogen and one OH group. So it's one-to-one -one stoichiometry to give us, um, let's see, we've got nitric acid, lithium nitrate and water. So um, if we have one mole of, if we have equal moles of both, we'll have nothing left over. So, so nothing's limiting. But in the second experiment, we use twice as much acid, but we keep the base the same. So now we're doing this. Right, we've got a lot more acid, same amount of base. So now the base is going to be the limiting reactant. So the heat that we produce is going to be based on the, on the base since that's the limiting reactant. So we didn't make any more heat than in the first experiment, but the mass of water went up. So if we think about this, we've got Q reaction plus Q heating up the solutions. I'll just call it Q water. This part stayed the same. This part has to stay the same too. And notice this part, we could write this out as M of water, heat capacity of water, delta T of water. So notice that the amount of heat we put in is the same, but we increased the mass. Well, since we didn't change the heat capacity of water, if we if we the amount of heat we put into the water stayed the same and we increased the mass, that must mean that delta T was smaller. In other words, we're putting the same amount of heat into the solution, but there's more solution, so the temperature increase is smaller. Okay, number three. Consider a process in which ionic compound dissolves in water. What is sign of delta H for this process? So we've got salt, solid, going to salt, aqueous. So we're going to break ionic bonds. Now that's going to cost us energy. That's exothermic. On the other hand, we're going to make ion dipole interactions so when we make ion dipole interactions that is we're forming we're essentially forming bonds so for that that's an exothermic process so if we have an exothermic process and an endothermic process and we add them up What's the sum? Well, it depends on the size of these two pieces. So if we don't know the numbers, we can't figure out for the overall process whether it's exothermic or endothermic. 
so more data is needed. And in fact, in lab, you found that some salts uh, dissolved and increased the temperature of the water, and some salts dissolved and decreased the temperature of the water. So um, it's going to vary by compound because those two terms can be different sizes. Uh, oh, and by the way, there's not any consistent trend. There's not a consistent trend with charge density here because both of these terms, this first one and this second one, they both get bigger in size with increased charge density. So we can't use charge density to predict any trends in delta H. Consider the process. We, we can't do it to predict uh, any trends in the signs of delta H of solution. Okay, consider the process in which an ionic compound dissolves in water. What is the sign of delta S for this reaction if the system of the con if the system is the contents of the beaker? Okay, so basically the same thing we had before, and we can imagine that um, there's a couple different ways to do this. One is to imagine. Let's break it up a little differently this time. Let's go from salt to ions in the gas phase to ions in the aqueous phase. So this would be delta S of solution, right? This is the, this is what we're talking about, right? We're taking stuff, solid phase salt, and dissolving it in water. Um, we, we can break it into the upper path. If we do this, this is the lattice process right so lattice energy or in this case would be lattice entropy and the other one would be hydration okay now for the first one for the first process taking the salt and blow it up into separate ions entropy goes up by quite a bit right the ions are free to move about um, and so we definitely are going to increase our entropy in the second step entropy is going to go down because not only are the ions less mobile in water, we know that all the ions are surrounded by a hydration sphere of oriented waters, right? So we've got these water molecules that are stuck to a sodium ion, and we can draw a picture that's sort of reversed for this for a chloride ion. I'm just gonna draw a few, but you get the idea, right? If I have a chloride ion, I'm gonna have hydrogens pointing towards my water like this. So. So in either case, I've oriented the water, and if I orient the water, um, it's going to have fewer microstates. And so that means that as I do this, so all of this, by the way, is aqueous ions. Let's do that. Um, so entropy goes down. So do we know which of these terms is bigger? We don't unless we have data. So more data is needed. Okay. In this case, there is a trend, though, with charge density. Okay, the trend is, so, so we can make relative comparisons between two different salts to see which one is more likely to be negative or which one's more likely to be positive. We can't say if they're positive or negative, we can just say relative to each other, which one's more positive or which one's more negative. And that trend is that this effect is affected by charge density. The more charge density in the ions that make up the salt, the bigger this effect is going to be, the more it's going to orient water. And so some salts with really high charge density, this term gets so big that it dominates, and the, um, and the delta S for solution ends up being a negative number. So even though you're dissolving the salt, the entropy change for the salt water system is negative because of that orientation effect. OK, uh, number five. Uh, two parts, um, or there's two questions. Let's do the first one. Calculate the value of delta H for the reaction below. So to calculate a delta H, it's gonna be the heat of formation for the products minus the heat of formation for the reactants. And so we're gonna have to look these things up so we're going to have the heat of, um, of formation of 
the di, di nitrogen um, tetrahydrate. So we've got, um, oops, I'll just write, write this in like this. And we gotta be careful, we're talking specifically about the liquid phase. Some of these things have different phase labels, so we have to pay attention to that. And we subtract the reactants, and we do have to pay attention to the coefficients. Okay, so there's a two here, we have to put that two in there as well. So minus two times the heat of formation of ammonia. We have to be careful because in our table we've got gas and liquid and gas. We might have gas, liquid, and aqueous. Um, we're interested just in gas. Okay. Uh, so we're going to look these numbers up in our equation sheet. And we can see we've got our N2H4 down here. We're looking for the heat of formation of the liquid. And we've got ammonia. You've got to be careful because this includes gas and aqueous. We're looking at just the gas phase, so it's this number, 45.9. Okay, so we plug in those numbers. We've got our first heat of formation is 50.6 kilojoules per mole, minus two times the heat of formation of gas phase ammonia, which is negative 45.9 kilojoules per mole. And so that comes out to be, you can see this is gonna give us a positive number, and we've already got a positive number. So this gives us 142.4 kilojoules per mole. So this is an endothermic reaction. Okay. You'll notice that we went from um, two moles of gas to a mole of gas, to one mole of gas in a liquid. So the delta S for this is probably negative as well. So this is gonna be a pretty unfavorable reaction. Okay, so now we go to number six. So we've got hexane, and we see that we've got the boiling point, we've got the specific heat, and we've got the heat of vaporization. And we wanna find the value for the change in entropy. So we want delta S of vaporization. And that's gonna be equal to delta H of vaporization over the boiling temperature. So when we put this in, um, we'll put in the heat of vaporization, which was uh, over here. It's 29, we could say 29 kilojoules per mole or 29,000 joules per mole. And we have our boiling temperature at 342 kelvins. We have to be careful. Boiling points are often given in degrees C, but we have to remember to use kelvins here. And then we divide and that is going to give us an answer of 84.8 joules per mole per Kelvin. Okay, and and uh, because these uh, numbers tend to be smaller, we tend to use joules rather than kilojoules. All right, that's the end of the key, so thank you for watching.